I felt this courage in Chicago. As I moved through Mississippi and Georgia and Alabama, I feel this courage. Living every day under the threat of death, I feel this courage sometimes. Living every day under extensive criticism, even from Negroes, I feel this courage sometimes. Yes, sometimes I feel discouraged and feel my works in vain. But then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. There is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a bomb in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. God bless you. This was the dangerous group, the groups that we're dealing with now. This is a dangerous group that groups that we're fighting right now. Welcome to Gutter Inc. Video number two. Come on. Follow. This is a dangerous group that groups that we're dealing with now. Freedom and recognition right between right black and white people in this country right without right destroying the country, without this destroying right the right present right political right system. Right without destroying the present economic system, without rewriting the entire Constitution. It'll be a complete destruction of everything that America supposedly stands for before a white man in this country will recognize a black man as something on the same level with himself. And this is why the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that the best way to solve the problem is complete separation. Let the black man, those of our people in this country who want to, have a country of our own where we can go and stand on our own feet and solve our own problems and not have to continue going to court or waiting for some politician to legislate for another day. The Tulsa community of Oklahoma is a fairly affluent black community. And you had this portion where black Americans are doing very well. And there are segments of the white population who did not like this. As the success of Tulsa's black district grew, so did the underlying resentment among the white community. This resentment seethed under the surface, waiting for the right event to set the wheels of rage into motion. That moment came in late spring 1921. And so in February 1921, uh, my mother and father decided that he should go to Tulsa, where he could perhaps make a living practicing law. My father went on to Tulsa, and uh, he would bring us there at the end of the school term. So we were all packed and ready to go. And he was to come for us and uh, escort us to Tulsa. We were waiting for him to come, and he didn't come, and he didn't come, and he didn't come. On May 30th, 1921, Dick Rowland, a 19-year-old black shoeshine man stepped into the elevator operated by a white 17-year-old girl named Sarah Page. As Roland entered the elevator, he tripped over Page's shoe. In an attempt to regain his balance, he reached out and grabbed for her arm. Surprised, Page let out a scream that alerted nearby businessmen. A frightened Roland ran from the elevator. This innocent event was the spark that ignited the most gruesome race riot in American history. When modern people think of a race riot, they think of the L.A. riots or the Cincinnati riots that happened, where beleaguered black classes would take out in the street and start looting and burning. What race riots for most of the 20th century was white thugs going into black communities and indiscriminately clubbing black people, killing black people. Roland was quickly arrested and taken to the courthouse for a trial. A crowd of over 2,000 whites surrounded the courthouse, demanding that... This whole idea that because people made money, um, that they called it a black Wall Street, and they also dropped bombs in particular in that particular place. And about 70 people or more were killed. My father said that he saw the bombs being dropped from planes over the black section of the town, you know, it was not very long after World War I, and uh, there was this sort of um, use of uh, aircraft to uh, invade the areas of town that otherwise might not be reached. 
After the bombs, an estimated 10,000 white rioters descended upon Greenwood. The armed whites broke into the black homes and businesses, forcing the occupants out into the street, where they were led away at gunpoint to one of the growing number of internment centers. Anyone who resisted was shot. Next, the whites looted the homes and businesses, pocketing small items and hauling away larger items on foot or by car or truck. Finally, the white rioters set the homes and other buildings on fire, using torches and oil-soaked rags. When the Tulsa Fire Department showed up to douse the flames, they were turned away at gunpoint by the angry mob. They're using rioting to remind blacks that they have a place, and to leave that place is unadvisable under penalty of death at any time. And there is nothing to defend you. No white people are going to be tried for the murder of a black person. When I think of Tulsa, I think of it as being the most graphic illustration of the violence against black people during the 1920s and also connected to the fact that African-American soldiers were returning from World War I and there were people who did not like to see black men in uniforms and did not want to see African-Americans progress and uh, move out of their place. And so Tulsa then became a symbol to the white community that blacks were moving out of their place. And that's why uh, they had to be destroyed. In the end, 13 whites and an estimated 300 blacks had been killed. Many were buried in mass graves. The total destruction of Greenwood became apparent as the black Tulsans were released from their imprisonment and returned to their homes and businesses burned to the ground. Nearly 10,000 Tulsans, almost the entire black community, was now homeless.